what, 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 what does that manifest as? Fantastic. All right, so let's go back. So what, what's, what's the answer here? What are we going to do for this patient? I think you can just continue zoosin and continue with the vancomycin. Fantastic. You guys are great. All right. So, yeah. So this is, you know, kind of a very typical case you're going to see. You know, MRSA, a bacteremia, very typical. A typical patient. We know our hemodialysis patients, they are colonized with MRSA. So it's, it's so common to see, you know, MRSA bacteremia in that patient population. I'm sure you're going to see it in other patients. But let's just kind of talk, I'll go back to the, the Veragene assay. So um, we actually switched just about, I'm going to say two weeks ago, to um, the Accelerate Phenotest. And um, the, the Accelerate Phenotest, uh, let me just give you a background about that. The Accelerate Phenotest is a system which basically will identify the target within about two hours, and it uses in situ hybridization, it's fl uh, fluorescent, in situ hybridization and has multiple bacterial targets. And then it actually does antibiotic susceptibility testing. What it does is it actually, um, it, it actually has this micro camera that takes pictures of bacterial growth. And then it's actually, um, it's linked up uh, to a computer that basically, uh, it, what, what happens is the bacteria getting exposed to various susceptibilities of the, um, of the antibiotic. And as a result, what it does is it takes pictures every 10 minutes and it looks at bacterial growth and it can actually detect what the minimum inhibitory concentration is. So nowadays for our blood culture assay, if you have a positive culture in the morning and it says like gram negative rods, probably in a couple hours, it'll probably say E. coli. By within 12 hours of the blood culture bottle becoming positive, it will give you actual susceptibility testing. But the Viragene assay, and I think this is being used still at a lot of hospitals throughout, you know, uh, the country. This is actually another interesting assay, and I think what I like about it is it also helps us with resistance. Now, this Viragene assay, what, what what it will do is it will give you the target and it will give you the resistance gene, but you have to know what the resistance gene means. So I have on this slide the Viragene assay, and um, as was just mentioned, is that the, the positivity of you know a MECA gene, so if it, you know it'll say Staph aureus MECA gene present, then that tells you it's methicillin resistant. And they've looked at concordance studies, and the, and the concordance studies are good. So if it's if the MECA gene is present, then you absolutely need to treat with vancomycin, or, or you need to treat for MRSA. And we'll come back to management of MRSA bacteremia. If the MECA gene is absent then at that point you can switch. So what's going to be your drug for MSSA? What do you guys use for MSSA? It's up there. <laughs> it's, so napcillin and cephazolin. And, and I think either of those agents are go-to drugs for um, methicillin sensitive staph aureus. Now, let's just talk quickly about Enterococcus um, species. So you have Enterococcus fecalis and you have Enterococcus facing. So the majority of the Enterococcus fecalis species, and I'm going to say like close to 99%, will not be VRE. But the converse, if you get like presumptive Enterococcus facium, if you see something in your blood culture, it'll say, you know, Enterococcus facium, I think that is enough, in my mind, enough information to say, go ahead and treat with, um, you know, not, you know, go ahead and treat with um, one of the, the agents that we use to treat VRE. And the, the VRE um, uh, genes are your VAN-A and your VAN-B genes. Um, predominantly, um, VAN-A is the one that we see mostly um, in, in the States. Um, but but e e either way, when you see the presence of a VAN-A gene, your options really are going to be either zaptomycin or linazolid. Okay? Otherwise, if the VAN-A or VAN-B gene are absent, then um, you could easily go with a drug like either ampicillin or vancomycin, dependent on ultimate susceptibilities. Okay, so that's just a little bit background on on the genetics. And I think the reason why I want you to kind of know these genes because I think they're becoming more and more useful in helping us with antibiotic um, stewardship. And this is just really one uh, one study that I just want to throw up there for you. So, you know, when you think about somebody, you're, you're, you're rounding in the ICU. So you're on C42, rounding in the ICU. Your patient 
gets, you know, transferred from the floor in respiratory distress with what looks like, you know, a, a hospital acquired pneumonia. You know that you've got to cover for pseudomonas, and our the HAP guidelines tell us to cover for pseudomonas, cover for staph aureus, okay? So you're definitely going to cover for those too. Um, and, and again, you're going to use an anti pseudomonal agent such as Peptazo, you know, Cepatine, Maricam. Okay, but you also have to cover for MRSA in that initial impurity thing. That's what the HAP guidelines tell us. So you're going to get vancomycin. Now, what, what I'm going to ask you to do though is at the time when the patient gets transferred over, before you, you know, clearly you want to get the antibiotics on board as quickly as possible, you know, it's really a good idea to try to get um, an MRSA uh, nasal swab because um, the MRSA PCR nasal swab that can detect the MECA gene. And if the MECA gene is absent, it has excellent negative predictive value, 98%. And in this one very large study where they looked at over 11,000 patients, when they followed them um, prospectively, they found out that if the MRSA nasal swab was, was negative, um, um, they only like 0.22% developed had MRSA eventually grow. So, so the bottom line is, it could be very helpful for de-escalation of antibiotics, all right? So you can, you can clearly, you know, use the MRSA MECA, uh, you know, gene to determine whether or not you have to maintain the vancomycin, okay? So I, I, I think that's a really helpful tool kit um, in our, uh, you know, our ability to um, de-escalate antibiotics. So, um, I just want to uh, briefly, uh, you know, just mention, so, you know, we, we throw MRSA around, so what does it really mean when we say somebody has MRSA? So actually, you know, it's been around, MRSA has been around, you know, uh, you know, since the 1960s or so, and basically um, it is an MIC to oxacillin, which is, you know, similar to nacillin. It's an MIC of greater than four, okay? Um, but the thing about um, MRSA, remember, if it, it's resistant to oxacillin or methicillin, if it's MRSA, it has cross, it confers cross resistance to all your beta lactans. So that's going to be your first generation, second, third, um, and also your, um, uh, your, your carbapenems. Um, can anybody tell me the one cephalosporin that that's not a true statement for? Septarolene. Very good, septarolene. So remember, uh, septarolene um, is uh, an agent that uh, came out, and it's probably now at least 10 years or so, that has activity against um, gram positives, including drug resistant pneumococcus as well as MRSA. All right, and, um, and it's really uh, been a drug that we've actually used predominantly for um, skin and soft tissue infections. Um, but uh, the, the bottom line is that it's also being used for bacteremia, and I'll come back to that in a few uh, minutes. Um, okay. Uh, oh, uh, so this next slide, uh, just kind of a, a schematic, and this was kind of uh, pointed out early on. Um, so um, what, when somebody has MRSA, what, what's really going on? So that MECA gene, um, which is carried by the staphylococcal chromosomal cassette, actually the MECA gene causes an alteration in the PBPs or penicillin binding proteins. So they, they alter themselves to what's referred to as PBP2A, all right? And um, with this alteration, um, this will basically, it, it alters the configuration to the point where the beta-lactam, whether it be cephalosporin, nacillin, oxacillin, methicillin, whatever, none of them can bind to it, okay? And that's really what's going on there. Okay, um, and uh, you know, I, again, uh, I think this just says what, what I previously said. So again, just remember that the MECA gene causes an alteration in the penicillin binding protein to PBP2A, and that's what prevents uh, the attachment of the uh, beta-lactam group. So you might ask yourself, um, what, um, what do we have here at Georgetown in terms of MRSA? Um, and this is not the most recent ANSI biogram, but um, we publish an ANSI biogram annually, um, and it, if you go onto Starcourt and you go into the pharmacy tab, and there's also an antibiotic um, 
stewardship tab, we, 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 we update it. And I, I know we, we literally just finished updating the one uh, for the last year. And, and we've been a little slow because of COVID. Our microbiology lab has been, you know, really, you know, uh, they've been, uh, they had a lot of issues with making sure they can run enough COVID assays. So we've been a little slow with our publication of any biogram, but we do have one out finally. Um, but, and I think this is from about a couple of years ago, but I think that the, the bottom line is we've been running about somewhere in the order of about 57% of our staphylococcal aureus, aureus isolates are methicillin resistant. So, um, and, and actually it had been higher. So it's kind of been stable to, to better than it has been in past years. Um, I, and I, and I, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to go online to see what it was most recently, but um, uh, that be the case. Uh, we, 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 we've uh, been really kind of, you know, monitoring that and it's really not like it's going up or anything like that. Okay. So, um, all right. So, um, I want to kind of give a little history about vancomycin and kind of tell you where it stands in terms of the management of MRSA. And vancomycin has been around since, you know, uh, 1950s. I mean, it's, it's an old, old agent. And, um, uh, and it's really interesting. I mean, if you look at the picture there, you wonder how the heck they used to infuse that into a patient. Um, it, it used to be referred to as Mississippi mud. Um, and then um, it actually went away as a drug because there was so much ototoxicity and nephrotoxicity. And then sometime in the 1970s, um, you know, Eli Lilly, which was the company that made vancomycin went and, you know, because MRSA started increasing dramatically in the 1970s, there was no agent to treat it. So they actually went on to um, purify it um, and make it into a, a drug that was much more uh, manageable in terms of the ototoxicity and um, uh, uh, nephrotoxicity. Now, that all being said, um, when we uh, think about uh, vancomycin, um, we think about it as, you know, still being a potentially nephrotoxic agent. And um, what happened around 2009, and I'm sorry I'm giving you this history lesson, but it's, it is kind of interesting. In 2009, you know, the Infectious Disease Society of America and um, the American Society for Hospital Pharmacists actually, uh, you know, convened a guideline meeting, and they came out with guidelines. And at that point, not only were we seeing Methis MRSA, but we were seeing MRSA that was developing something known as heteroresistance. And heteroresistance means that, you know, the MIC for vancomycin, we say it's sensitive if it's less than two, but the, the, but the reality is between one and two, failures of treatment have been reported with vancomycin. So what the, uh, what the guidelines committee said at that time was like, well, we can't, you know, MRSA is a bad infection. So what they did is they said, it, let's push up the level. So what they did is they came up with very aggressive guidelines. And many of you, know, you know, have been practicing these guidelines. You have been using the trough level of 15 to 20, right? You say, oh, MRSA in the bloodstream, we have to dose to aim for a trough level of 15 to 20. Well, the reality is, is that, you know, when what we, what, what, what has become recognized is that you see quite a difference when you have high trough levels versus low trough levels in terms of nephrotoxicity. And nephrotoxicity has been reported as high as 30 to 40 percent compared to 10 to 20 percent if you look at lower trough levels. Um, so that, you know, so over the last several years, people have been recognizing that, hey, we're seeing lots of nephrotoxicity with, with vancomycin. So what answer now is our new guidelines. And our new uh, vancomycin guidelines, um, these uh, have come out in 2020. And um, just within, again, since May, um, we, are, we have now incorporated the guidelines here at Georgetown. And this is really based not on trough levels. It's based on area under the curve over the MIC. So the, what we refer to as the AUC to MIC ratio. And this is well beyond the scope of even an ID doctor's, you know, understanding of pharmacology. Um, we, you know, they, they've used Bayesian methodology and basically based on 
um, the, all this modeling data, they've created these very nice um, pharmacologic um, uh, software packets that Georgetown um, and MedStar have purchased. It's, this one is referred, the one that we use here is referred to as Insight RX. And we as a group now, when you write for vancomycin, you, you, you just order it and then pharmacy takes over from here on in. And they do very aggressive early dosing and they, with, you know, and if you remember with um, the old vancomycin approach, what we would usually do is we'd say, okay, you know, give a loading dose, you know, start them on it, and then at um, dose number five, order a trough level. They actually will calculate within, they, they usually um, will, will uh, they, they will usually use two levels, but even with one level, they can make some really good calculations. Um, and again, what's very important about this is this is based on uh, the fact that they are assuming the minimum inhibitory concentration of the bacteria is one. All right. Um, remember before I said, um, you know, I, I said that there was this creep of the MIC going, you know, around one to two. Even though less than two is considered susceptible, we now have changed our guidelines to the point because now what's recognized. If the MIC is higher than one, we're never going to achieve adequate levels without having nephrotoxicity. So kind of there's been a really big paradigm shift in the approach to vancomycin dosing. Again, the good news for all you guys now, you know, you know, and I, I don't know what it's like at the other hospitals, but now it's phar pharmacy is actually managing all the dosing, including the levels and things like that. Yeah, that's the 21st century right there. Pharmacy's <laughs> finally helping us out. <laughs> no, and, and, but you know, we are stupid when it comes to drug dosing in, in antibiotics. I mean, there's, there's a lot of neat things that we can do to optimize dosing and things like that. And like I say, this is kind of the first and the step. And I, I will say this, I, I don't know how soon this is going to be, but you know, they're, they're, people are even talking about looking at levels for cephalosporins and things like that. I mean, I think the thing is when you have a low therapeutic to toxic, that, you know, when you have a very tight therapeutic to toxic window there, you're more likely to want to do therapeutic drug monitoring. But that really, again, you know, therapeutic drug monitoring by people who know how to monitor drugs is, is, is really the safest for our patient, patients. So um, what I want to do is I want to just... Uh, um, you know, kind of sum this one section up um, with, with regards to vancomycin. So, so what do we do when we have somebody with uh, MRSA sepsis or, you know, we want to use uh, vancomycin? So, uh, so specifically, somebody has an MRSA bloodstream infection. Um, the first line agent is always vancomycin, okay? The good news, I will say, is we do not see a lot of high MICs. And remember, the MIC that we're looking for is one or less. So less than or equal to one is the MIC that we all are, are looking at. Um, the, the drug of choice is still going to be vancomycin, and this is vancomycin that needs to be dosed not at 15 to 20. Um, it should not be dosed at 15 to 20 um, in terms of the trough level, but rather the uh, AUC to MIC ratio that they're aiming for is 400 to 600. Okay, so that's kind of the new quote unquote trough or monitoring that we use. We want 400 to 600 of the a AUC to MIC ratio. Now, what happens if you wind up seeing somebody with a MIC that's higher than that? Um, so, and, and our farms are looking into, you know, they will, they will check it. But, you know, even you as, you know, a clinician, when you have MRC in, MRSA in the blood, always make sure that the MIC is less than or equal to one, okay? Just you know, make sure you do that. If it's greater than that, um, probably the paradigm uh, shift is really now to use daptomycin, okay? Um, and dose with daptomycin at about anywhere from six to eight mg per kg Q24 hours. So 1.5 to two. Now, what happens when it's greater than two? And again, we rarely see this. Um, and we, we, we haven't seen a lot of the the, you know, the intermediate, like the 1.5, but it, it greater than two, the data is really not out there to tell us exactly what to do. What do some people do? And this is where it gets back to some kind of unique situations where we might use um, daptomycin 
plus a drug like citarly, all right? And there's, you know, there is data on citarline to treat staph aureus bacteremia. So some folks have been using daptomycin plus septarline when you have that high MIC. And the reason why we see this sometimes you can also see an increase in the, um, or I'm sorry, you can see reduced dose susceptibility to daptomycin too. So uh, again, my, my take home point is still um, for serious MRSA, uh, bloodstream infections, vancomycin is pretty much going to always be your go-to drug. Um, it's going to be dosed by, by pharmacologists with an AUC to MIC ratio of 400 to 600. For your 1.5, I think you, you, you avoid vancomycin, and in that setting, you should be using daptomycin. And as chair of the antibiotics um, you know, stewardship committee, I don't like to say that, out, you know, say that um, uh, too much because um, I'm trying to reduce antibiotic costs, but that being said, daptomycin is very appropriate in that, that, in that situation. Um, and then again, if it's greater than two, we don't really know the best thing. I mean, clearly you should be, you should be contacting ID in, in these situations. And in that setting, we might use daptomycin plus septarlin. Um, and again, usually higher doses of daptomycin. Um, one other thing I'm gonna say about this, and again, um, Probably my ID fellows will lose sleep over this, but I, I just need to also mention that, you know, they've actually looked at studies of um, staph aureus bacteremia. Um, you know, there, there was a study several years back that looked at whether or not an ID console is obtained and there's better outcomes for patients. Uh -huh. So I, uh, although I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to sit up here and advertise uh, uh, th this, uh, you know, to consult us, you really probably should be consulting the ID service when you have staph aureus bacteremia, because at least, you know, um, you know, as at least what they say in this paper is that there's better outcomes. Um, and maybe, you know, it, it may have been in community hospitals and things like that. You guys are really smart here, so maybe you don't need us as much, but I'm just gonna say that it's, it is important to, to know, even acknowledge that. Okay, all right, so um, let's switch over to another thing. And um, Sajid, can we get help from somebody else? Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, Patient is an 80 year old female, uh, New Hampshire resident. New nursing home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I was thinking this was going to be like a. Like yeah, a, you, you think it was going to be a <laughs> like that. Okay. Nursing home resident from New Hampshire. <laughs> fever, altered mental status, and hypertension. And there's no UA reveal, scared there's a few three disease. Urine cultures reveal uh, club cell pneumonia. Uh, blood cultures reveal four out of four bottles with club CLL with the following susceptibility pattern. Okay. So what, what looking at the susceptibility pattern, do you have any, you know, any kind of thoughts just looking at that susceptibility pattern? What if the hip change is covered up? Did I assume it's an S? I'm sorry? Yeah, it's an S. Okay. The, uh, it, he was asking, you couldn't see the piptazo, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's sensitive. It's sensitive, actually. Piptazo sensitive, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sorry, I just didn't hear So I this, think that um, this is a case where I probably assume this is an SBL. And, 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 and I'm just curious, you're assuming it is, but why are you assuming that? The resistance pattern is sensitive to piptazo, but the resistance patterns otherwise suggest uh, the presence of the NPL, so I probably want to choose a, a, okay. an, uh, All right, you're, you're going, you're actually going down the right path, which means you'll probably get the, the question right on the exam, but you're using a little bit of the wrong logic, and I'll explain that to you in a second, but I, 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 I like your thought process. So you think this could be an ESBL, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. All right, so let's see. All right, so what, what, what would you do then? In terms of treatment, okay. So you're doing that for what reason, though? The same reason I use. I have to use it. <laughs> okay. All right. So you got the question right, which is good. Okay. And the boards don't know what you're really thinking inside, so so that's good. But but I, I yeah, no, no, that that's that's an excellent question. Um. So uh, let's just be be very basic for a few minutes. Let's talk about. Um, ESBLs, uh, real, oh, I'm sorry, let's talk about beta-lactamases. 
Um, oh, okay, so um, remember the, the beta lactamases are uh, plasmid mediated enzymes that um, basically um, ba basically break up. Um, I think I have a picture on this. Yeah, there it is. Break up the beta lactam ring um, of all beta lactams. Okay, so so that that's in general just when we look at beta lactamases, that's what they do. They're going after that beta lactam ring. They're they're they're. It's basically an enzyme produced by gram negative um, uh, a bacteria that basically are breaking up the beta lactam uh, ring. And you know the initial uh, the, the initial beta lactamases were, were described in a Greek patient, and um, and, and uh, basically um, the first beta lactamases, TEM1 and TEM2, were named after this Greek patient where they were first identified. Um, so uh, with the um, so so with with the beta lactamases, um, you know many gram negatives because they're plasmid mediated, they can be transmitted re relatively rapid um, through, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, from bacteria to bacteria, and you know, many of our TEM1, TEM2 beta lactamases, these will um, th these will cause resistance to some of the early penicillins like penicillin, ampicillin, um, and uh, they will also get like the first generation cephalosporins like uh, cefazolin. Okay, um, and these would be like your E. coli, your Klebsiella, and Pseudomonas can produce them. And then also some other organisms also produce TEM1 and TEM2 beta lactamases. So for example, that H. influenza, um, when you think about, you know, somebody who has um, recurrent uh, sinusitis or bronchitis due to that H. influenza, um, you know, one of the drugs we use as outpatient is amoxiclobulonic. Well, why is that? Well, because H. influenza can produce a beta lactamase um, that breaks down amoxicillin. But if you put the beta lactam inhibitor, pavilonate there, you know, drug augmentin, you can overcome that. Um, Neisseria gonorrhea uh, also can produce beta lactamase, Moricella catarrhalis. So there's a lot of them. I want to come to um, what uh, what this case is really illustrating. So um, the early beta lactamases will effect, as I said, the first generation cephalosporins, but um, many of the third generation cephalosporins, um, and that includes our drug ceftriaxone, um, they, they and, and the more advanced cephalosporins will have this oxyamino side chain, and hence the early beta lactamases cannot, um, cannot uh, you know, they'll, be, they'll all be sensitive. However, um, the ESBLs really what they do is they can disrupt um, antibiotics that have this oxyamino side chain. And that's what your extended spectrum beta lactamases are. So your ESBLs are extended spectrum beta lactamases. So awesome, what you said, you said piptazo, it was sensitive to piptazo, but resistant to other things. The thing I want you all to look at is not piptazo. I want you to look at ceftriaxone. If you see ceftriaxone resistance, if you see resistance to ceftriaxone on your antibiotic susceptibility, the, um, the new guidelines really say now, call that an ESBL, all right? So, um, so I think, uh, you know, again, it's not the sensitivity or resistance to Pictazo, but it's really the sensitivity or resistance to ceftriaxone, the third generation cephalosporin, okay? Um, what's interesting about ESBLs is when you look at the susceptibility pattern for an ESBL, like in this patient, you saw it, it, it was resistant to, you know, cefazolin, it was resistant to ceftriaxone, but it was sensitive to cefoxetin and cefotitan. Now, those are kind of second generation-ish uh, cephalosporins. We don't use them a lot anymore, but they were actually cefamycin, so they're a little different. And if you, and again, a lot of times I don't even see these being reported as much anymore, but if you see an organism that has resistance to ceftriaxone but sensitive to um, ce um, uh, cefotitan or, or cefoxin, then you should assume it's also a beta lactamase. But I think the more important thing, I, the take home niblet I want you to remember when you're interpreting these gram negative um, antibiograms is if you see that resistance to ceftriaxone, then you should assume it's an ESBL. And the problem with ESBLs, as you know, is ESBLs, um, you know, 
patients who get ESVLs are, you know, often patients, we see them in the community, but they're often patients who are hospitalized for prolonged periods of time. And I think um, uh, the, the, the bottom line I just want to make about that is, so these patients get hospitalized for, you know, prolonged periods of time, they can confer cross resistance to things like the quinolones, you might see sometimes with the immunoglycosides, but, but the bottom line is you have to be very careful that ESVLs can have some other cross resistance um, mechanisms. Um, okay, so, um, I wanted, I, wanted to have, I wanted to show something here. Give me a second. Oh, yeah, that's what I wanted. Um, so uh, I wanted to show you from our antibiogram. So you might, you might say to yourself, so what is, um, what, what, what is the level of, um, of uh, ESVLs here at Georgetown? Like what percentage of the population? Um, and this is a relatively recent antibiogram. And, and I can tell you from looking at the antibiogram this year, it's, it's basically been stable. But what I, I have uh, circled there for you is really that um, if you look at our most common uh, ESBL organisms, which are um, E. coli and Klebsiella, if you look at those two, um, those two, um, if, if you look at the susceptibility, so um, E. coli is 90% susceptible to ceftriaxone, so 10% of resistance. So about 10% of our E. coli's are going to be ESBLs. And probably for um, uh, for uh, uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae, eleven percent. Okay, so no, not a super high amount, but high enough that it is uh, you know it is of concern. You should be aware of it. Um, so again, uh, when we look at um, you know when when you're um, lo looking at hospitals antibiogram, you, you can kind of tell if you you know look, just look that look down that column that looks at ceftriaxone and see what percentage of ceftriaxone resistant. And I, I will say this, this is kind of the, um, the, the CLSI, which is um, a, a committee on uh, the, uh, committee on Lab Standards Institute. Basically, what they do is they define now ESBLs as being resistant to ceftriaxone. We used to have to do some confirmatory tests, but now they, 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 they will confirm it. And I, actually, our lab does report whether it's an ESBL or not. But you know, you might you know see a susceptibility pattern on your boards. You might see it in other hospital, maybe that they don't report this. And I just want you to really kind of keep that in the back of your mind when you talk about it. But let me just go back um, one slide. So um, getting back to the resistance genes, um, I think the important resistance gene for um, uh, for ESBLs is actually um, the uh, is actually CTXM. And, and again, um, in the viragene assay, we used to, again, using the blood culture system that we used to use, it will tell us that, you know, Klebsiella pneumonia detected CTXM gene present. Then that is, uh, that, that's a, an important indication that this is an ESVL, and it really has treatment um, implications that I will cover in a second. Um, there's a bunch of other resistance genes that are related to carbapenem resistant enterobacteria ACA. Um, I don't want to go into them, but um, the KPC or Klebsiella pneumonia carbapenemase is the dominant strain that, or, or the dominant um, cause of CRA um, here at Georgetown. Okay, right, so we talked about that. So, um, so this gets back to uh, uh, kind of our initial question. You guys all got it right, which is great. Um, and again, as the antibiotic stewardship chair, I don't often like to admit that this data exists, but the data does exist, so I have to, I have to um, live by it. But the bottom line is, um, so for many years, um, when ESPLs were first rec recognized, we would often see, you know, that they're susceptible to piptazobactam, and we'd say, hmm, maybe we can get away and we, we don't have to be as broad with our carbapenems and treat with piptazobactam. And the, uh, and you know, the, the Americans weren't brave enough to do this study, but uh, the Europeans were brave enough to do this study. And what they did was they randomized about 391 patients to receive either um, piptazobactam or a carbapenem. But the important thing that they also did was they actually looked at 
they, they looked at whether it was sensitive to Pipteso. So these were patients who had E. coli or Pudsiel identified, and then they said, okay, is it sensitive to Pipteso? And if it was, they were randomized. And then they were randomized to Pipteso versus uh, a carbapenem like Meropenem. And what they found was, and it was a study that was stopped by the DSMB, there was about a 12% mortality in the Pipteso arm and only 3% mortality in the carbapenem arm. And as a result of this, and this was actually published um, in JAMA, I think I have, yeah, yeah, this, so this is kind of, I took this right from the article. So this was published in JAMA, and um, really um, this data now is out there and really supports that we should be using carbapenems for patients with um, for patients uh, who have PSVLs. So that that this data has come out, and then um, really, and just re last year, the Infectious Disease Society of America um, in in 2020 actually published guidelines for drug resistant um, bacteria, and um, in in those guidelines. Um, really, what, what it came out is if you have somebody with a serious, um, you know, ESBL infection, then carbapenems, go ahead and use the carbapenems. Go for the gusto and use the carbapenems, all right? So carbapenems really now are the treatment of choice for that. Um, they do recommend, though, that if, you know, you start them on a carbapenem and it's a urinary source, like, you know, say, you know, like in this patient, you know, this patient was, you know, uh, it had it had basically a UTI as well as, well as a, 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 a you know a bloodstream infection. If it has a u urinary uh, uh, source, then what you could do is you can actually consider de-escalation to oral or quinolones if it's sensitive, of course. Okay, um, but I think the point is is that really your initial treatment for a bloodstream infection due to an ESVL should always be a carbapenem. Um, and, and, and I think um, it, it's recommended not to use Pipteso, not to use uh, Cefepine, even if it's sensitive. Uh, you, you know, so it, that's really the, the bottom line. Um, so for ESBLs, use, use a carbon panel. All right. Okay. I think we need some help with this one. So this is a really complicated case, but um, we see, I, I, I think you know where as a as a transplant center, we see a fair amount of um, uh, of uh, you know both kidney, pancreas, liver, but we also do multivisceral organ transplants. So these patients usually present with short gut syndrome, usually due to some intra-abdominal catastrophe where they've had to reset lots and lots of uh, bowel and things like that. And um, I you know I I think um, you know you. You might see these patients in the unit, um, you know, but you know they're often on the, the transplant uh, surgical service. Sometimes, if they've been out far enough, you might see these patients. So maybe we can get somebody to kind of help us with this one. Sorry, I took the one person getting water. Sure. Patients of 53-year-old male with SGS cirrhosis, um, the vascular transplant, which includes monolithic liver. Okay, so multivisceral transplant who develops now an empyema. Okay, all right. So, uh, so what do we have there? What what, what do you see there? Pseudomonas. You got it. All right. So why is it pseudomonas? So let, let's just because the slide says so. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Because the slide says so. But um, so what? What I uh, so remember, you know, just remember, so most you know, it's gram negative rod. Um, it ha and this is a, like one other little teaching point I want I want to tell you because you, you sometimes get these results. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you get these these pre preliminary microbiology results. So remember, we have our lactose fermenters and our non lactose fermenters. So our lactose fermenters are your E. coli, Klebsiella, Enterobacter. They're the ones, you put them on McConkey, the and they look pink on McConkey. Um, Pseudomonas is a non-lactose fermenter. Um, and on McConkey, it's not pink, it has more of an opaque appearance, so it doesn't have that pigment. So my, my niblet 
to remember here is, you know, when you get those urine cultures and they say greater than 100,000 non-lactose fermenters, all right, I want you to at least say to yourself, I need to cover for pseudomonas, okay? So if you see that, that, that term, like non-lactose fermenter, um, you really, really need uh, to consider, um, you really need to consider, uh, you know, empirically covering for pseudomonas. Now, are there other non-lactose fermenters? Yeah, Proteus is a non-lactose fermenter, um, but, and, but, you know, but again, I think in the hospital, when it says non-lactose fermenter, I think that's the most important thing. Now, if you're talking about gastroenteritis, um, the two non-lactose fermenters from, you know, if you get a stool specimen back, two non-lactose fermenters are going to be your salmonella and shigella. But again, for the purpose of the hospital, I think, you know, if you have a sputum culture come back and it says, you know, you know, uh, non-lactose fermenting gram-negative rods, please give pseudomonas coverage in that set, okay? Um, all right, uh, so let's see, let's go back to our case. So we think that this patient's got pseudomonas and... Okay, so what do you what do you think about that? Anybody have a clue? All right. So this is what the ID service does when we get uh, or, organisms like that. <laughs> um, we just need to sit down and drink a little wine and kind of think about it. Um, so you know, so so again, this is um, this is really what we would call, um, and actually the new terminology, we used to call it NDR pseudomonas, but the, um, the, the, ID, uh, it, it, the Infectious Disease Society of America now uh, talks about it as being difficult to treat pseudomonas or DTR pseudomonas. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, this is a mess. The thing I'm gonna say about this is if you get a pseudomonas like this, you've gotta call us, but really the important thing that you wanna do is you wanna call the lab and make sure they're setting up um, susceptibilities for the advanced generation agents that might have activity against it. So you know, you, you, you know, you, you could just throw your hands up and say, I don't know what to do. But I think the first step you want to do, if you get something like this back, you call the microbiology lab and you say to them, you know, can you please test for the advanced cephalosporins? And they'll and they'll do that for you. And actually, they're technically supposed to do this. That's part of the protocol. So usually you don't even have to make a phone call. We always email them and we, or, you know, we just say, please, you know, we want to have susceptibilities for all the advanced generations. I'll talk about those in a second. Um, okay, so, uh, so, so what I wanted to throw, I threw, wanted to throw up here for you is, so how resistant is our pseudomonas here at Georgetown? Um, and I think, the, the point is, this is again probably from it's either from last year or it might be this may be from 2018 to 2019 because I think our 2019 to 2020 never got published. But anyway, um, if you look at I, what I have there is the susceptibility to some of the more common anti pseudomonal agents, right? So, you know, you're, our, our kind of workhorse for pseudomonas are cefepime, piptazo, and you know, and our carbapens, meropen, right? Um, so uh, if you look at that, you say, well, if you, if you isolate pseudomonas from the entire hospital, if you look at all, okay, we're not doing terrible. They're not 100%, but, you know, you could see like, you know, Piptazo 77, the other ones are in the 80s. But what I want you to look at is what happens when you isolate pseudomonas in the ICU? And do you see, you see the difference there. So, for example, so if you what what meropenems in you know it, it is around eighty percent in the general hospital. But when you get into the isolates in the ICU, it drops to fifty five percent. That's our ICU. Okay. This is this is this it's is not Georgetown. Like a national ICU. This, no, no, this is Georgetown. This is Georgetown yeah. data. This is exactly yeah. Georgetown data. So so the, so this is what you know. Again, that, that's what I'm saying. This is what we're dealing with. And I will tell you, we. Again, coming back to the, um, the anti-biogram, we actually, again, on that pharmacy tab on Starport, if you want to look at the ICUs at Georgetown, we actually have these published. We have, we, we have it for all the ICUs, C42, C43, and C63, but we also have it for, um, 
it, it, we, we also have it for uh, each of the individual units. And I know there's been some reassignment of the, of the beds. And I, I realize now C41 is an ICU and it wasn't before. So we, I, I, I don't even know if we've actually recalculated it for this year. But, but th this would be, this would be, yeah. uh, a, th this is a combination of C42, C43 and C63. So, it, it, you know, and C42 being what, what it's always been, C43, which, what, which was really the surgical ICU, and then C63, which was in neurosurgical nor ICU. So you can see there's a pretty significant drop. Um, you know, so, so, so just, just be aware that, you know, what we're dealing with um, out there. Okay, so, um, when we talk about um, MDR uh, pseudomonas, um, I, I think, you know, I, I use the term DTR, but I'm just gonna say, so MDR really means developing resistance to um, one agent in three classes. So, so again, it, it gives you an idea. So if you have like, you know, um, if, if, if you have one of the carpapenems, you know, one of the uh, third or fourth generation cephalosporins in Pictazo, that's considered uh, drug resistant, or it can go into quinolones. And the thing with multi-drug resistant pseudomonas is it's resistant to, you know, when, when you get to that point, you'll, you'll find lots of resistance and you're usually left over with only things like the immunoglycosides. That's the unfortunate thing. And the unfortunate thing, and coming back to this case, you might have said, well, you could have, you could have used amicacin. It was sensitive to amicacin. But the problem with amicacin, remember, is this, we were dealing with a, uh, an infection uh, in the lungs, empyema. Aminoglycosides are not good for IV aminoglycosides are not good for the lungs. And you don't get really good levels within the lung tissue. And, and that's one of the reasons why you'll see occasionally with some of these MDR um, agents that we have, we will use um, inhaled amicacin, inhaled genomycin, or you know, we will use inhaled in, in combination with a, um, you know, something like cefepime or piptase or something like that with something that has a really ugly resistance pattern. And again, it's because we don't get really good levels within lung parenchyma, so we, we give it as sort of, I guess, the way we refer to it, it's like a topical agent, oh, okay? All right, so, and the, the other thing about MDR pseudomonas is it, it, it becomes MDR via uh, many, many different mechanisms. So pseudomonas uh, can produce a carbapenemase, it uh, also, what it does is, it actually can close. Um, you know, it, it actually has this outer um, outer membrane. It can close off those outer membranes so antibiotics can't diffuse through. Um, and also, it has porin channels also within its cell wall that can close up, that can close out. And then also, it can have a, a drug efflux pump. So pseudomonas. That's why pseudomonas is so problematic. It has so many different ways of developing uh, resistance. So I wanna just kind of talk quickly um, about our agents that we have for pseudomonas um, that, you know, just in general. So what are our workforces? So I, again, um, you know, as much as I make fun of how much you guys use Piptazo, you know, if you are concerned about pseudomonas, again, at Georgetown, Piptazo is not a terrible empiric therapy. I mean, it's, you know, it, they're all about 70 to 80, you know, 77 to 80 percent. So I think, you know, it's still, uh, you know, Piptazo, the fourth generation cefepime has activity. We even have a third generation ceftazidine that has activity uh, against pseudomonas. Um, the carbapenems, uh, again, these are all your general workforces. Now, your fluoroquinolones. Um, we had a period of time when we looked at ciprofloxacin susceptibilities. And it, we, we used to say Cipro is anti-pseudomonal, but we had a period of time when we looked at the Cipro at Georgetown and it was only like 35% active against pseudomonas. But um, interestingly enough, as time has gone on, because of all of the, um, the adverse events that have become increasingly uh, noted with the quinolones, whether it be the dysglycemia um, associated with you know, it, you know, it can cause dyslexemia, both hypo and hyperglycemia. You know, the altered mental status in the elderly, um, tendinopathy, um, the risk, uh, increased risk of ruptured aortic aneurysms, all of those things we've kind of shied away. And actually our quinolone um, activity has actually increased. And I think it's closer to like 70% now, but, but the bottom line is technically both Cipro and Levo could have activity 
against Pseudomonas. Um, clearly, our aminoglycosides have activity. Um, the drug Acetrinam, I just got to mention something about Acetrinam. Acetrinam is considered to be a good drug. Uh, I mean, it's an, it's an, um, it, it treats aerobic gram-negative organisms. But it is no more potent than a drug like ceftriaxone or ceftazidine. Um, it does have anti-pseudomonal activity, but it's not like a big gun. And again, my big thing about Acetrinam, really try to get the best, um, you know, the best uh, um, uh, drug allergy history you can, because that drug is, oh, oh they're, they, they were, you know, they had uh, penicillin allergy when they were three years old and they're 85 now. And so we can't, we can't give any, please take a good history because the bottom line is H3&M is not kind of a great drug for serious gram-negative infections. So I, that's just my little side note there. Um, but it does have activity against pseudomonas. And then clearly, uh, colistin has some activity. Uh, it does have activity against pseudomonas, but the colistin is kind of falling out of the out of favor. But what I want to introduce you to is just um, a couple of the newer agents. I'm just, I just have them listed here and tell you what, what you know, um, what, what we would do. So again, a patient like this with this, um, you know, this patient with short guts, gut syndrome, status post multivisceral transplant now with a pseudomonas and um, with that resistance pattern, we need a lot of help. So we will, we would call the lab and the lab will actually perform um, antibiotic susceptibility testing against this advanced generation. So cetaz, um, cetalazine, tazobactam, which is also Zervaxa, cetazidine, avibactam, which is avicaz. Um, and then we also have on formulary, meropenem, vabribactam. So it'll, it, it will perform um, susceptibility testing against those. Um, additionally, um, the, the, um, the other really new kid in town, which is cefadiracol. So cefadiracol is a new cephalosporin, which actually has a very unique um, uh, mechanism of action. What it actually does is bacteria love iron, and it acts as a cytophore. And what it does is it takes advantage of the fact that bacteria like to bring in iron into the cell and it takes advantage. So it almost serves as a Trojan horse. It gets taken up be because of its siderophore side chain and gets into the bacteria. So it, it, it evades like the beta lactamases and a lot of the resistance mechanisms. So cephadiracol may be, you know, a drug. And again, we just put it on formulary this past year. So I, I've used it like I think once or so at this point, but that may be a, a, a go-to drug um, in the future too. Um, but our lab will also test against cephadiracol. We sometimes have had to ask them to do it, like they've been resistant to Avica, uh, you know, Avicaz or Zervaxa. I want to just say one other term thing about cephalazine, uh, um, uh, tazobactam. That actually is one of our better anti-pseudomonal agents right now. The problem is it is not available. There were some problems with manufacturing. We haven't had um, Zervax or Septalazane, um, Tazobactam for almost a year and a half now. Um, my understanding is maybe towards the latter part of this year, they'll be able to provide it to us again. So we can't even use that. But actually that was really, when we looked at susceptibilities against uh, uh, difficult to treat uh, Pseudomonas, we found that um, Septalazane, Tazobactam was one of our better ones. It was better than uh, Abacaz. Um, uh, and I, I, I can't compare it to Cephadiracol because we, we didn't have the data at the time, but I can just tell you it worked worked quite well. So again, I think for, and I think I have a, a slide on this. Um, I think for, um, uh, you know, for difficult to treat uh, Pseudomonas, again, the first step is always going to be call the lab, um, you know, and, 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 you know, call the lab and ask them to run the susceptibility, the advanced susceptibility pattern. That's the first thing you want to do. Um, and then, you know, you might say, well, what do I do in the meantime? So, you know, this is where it gets a little difficult. And this is obviously you should be calling ID. But, you know, what we will sometimes do in the meantime is we will um, use a combination of an aminoglycoside and we would, we might use high dose uh, or we would use Piptazo, and you can run Piptazo over um, a continuous infusion. And sometimes you can overcome the MIC because you've got better drug exposure. So sometimes we'll use 
piptazo in combination with the amino glycoside, we might pull out colistin. Colistin's really fallen out of favor. I mean, there was a you know there was a period of about uh, 10 years where colistin was you know, we were using for multi-drug resistance, and and it, it probably has some activity. The problem with colistin is it has lots of nephrotoxicity, and we have difficult uh, problem. We have problems with with dosing it. So so you know we we don't have therapeutic monitoring, and so patients wind up all developing you know AKI as a complication of it. So we, we kind of have now shied away from colistin. Um, you know, I think, um, at, you know, for the, for the time being, you might say, so I think in terms of that whole idea of like, should we give combination treatment for um, multidrug resistant pseudomonas? I think at this point, um, the ID Society of America really recommends, you know, once you have the susceptibilities and it's sensitive to one of those, you know, first line agents, whether it be uh, citalazine, tazobactam, citalazine, maybe bactam, or meropenem, vaporbactam. If it's susceptible, they say dose dose appropriately, and you don't need to give dual or combination therapy. Possibly in the empiric period when you say, well, I'm not sure how best to do this, you know, you might consider doing combination, but really the take home message is now, once you have susceptibilities for pseudomonas, because I'm sure many of you have heard attending in the past, oh, I only treat pseudomonas with two agents. That's kind of fallen by the wayside. That data has, it's been shown to be too toxic and um, so I think the bottom line is, um, you know, if you're, you know, you know, somebody's in septic shock, you might want to use two agents up front. As soon as you have the susceptibility pattern, go and, and go with the one agent beta lactam. You know, stop the amino glycoside. And likewise with these, even with these extended uh, or these um, difficult to treat pseudomonas, I think I would go with uh, just a, a monotherapy once you have the susceptibility.